So this is a continuation of the House Appropriation Committee's morning meeting. And we're starting right off at 10 o'clock with the Department of Corrections. And we have Commissioner Baker here with his team, which he will introduce. But we also are having a joint um, a joint here, uh, a joint meeting with uh, the House Institutions and Corrections Committee with uh, Chair Representative Emmons and the members of her committee. So welcome. Um, uh, what we discovered yesterday or or what uh, we understand from yesterday is what you will be showing us, Commissioner Baker, are the changes made from the January proposal of your budget. And so we will be seeing the deltas. We will be seeing, uh, you'll be talking about any language changes and any uh, pressures, anything that was different from the January proposal. If possible, after you go through those changes, if there's initiatives that were status quo from January and are still on the table, uh, if you could just do a reminder of some of those issues, and I know that this is Mary's budget and she'll be going back and, and uh, looking at all of the things that um, we had discussed right before we left in March, but I wanna make sure that we don't miss any of the pieces that are still on the table from January and our initiatives that are going forward. Um, and other than that, uh, we will find natural stopping places with, within your uh, testimony and you have a presentation that Teresa will put up. And then I would ask committee members from appropriations and from institutions just to use your virtual blue hand. And uh, we, will, we will ask questions um, as, we, as we walk through the testimony. Commissioner Baker, um, Welcome, uh, Representative Emmons, before we move uh, on, is there anything you would like to say to open up this testimony? No, I think you summed it up very well. Um, I think it's really important for members to realize the starting point here is really the governor's proposed budget that was presented to us back in January. And, the, and what we're seeing today is any changes to that particular proposed budget. And it does not include any changes that our House Appropriations Committee was working on and ready to present to the full House at the end of March. So there's sort of three different budgets that we sort of have to look at. Um, so I just want every member of my committee to be aware of that. And we will work our way through those budgets and um... And, and work together carefully to make sure that we're not missing anything uh, when we pass this budget out. I do want to say I'm going to have to jump off for about five to seven minutes. And so when my screen goes blank, uh, Representative Hooper, you'll take over the committee and I should be right back. Um, but uh, let's get going. We have until 11 o'clock, um, a little bit uh, further if we need to. But Commissioner Baker, welcome. And if you'd like to introduce your team, who you brought with you, and then we'll start right in with um, your changes. Thank, thank you, Representative. Good morning. Um, who I brought with me was Matt D'Agostino, um, who was going to do the overview of the money piece. And uh, we'll get to that in a minute. But I'd be more than happy afterwards to talk about initiatives that are ongoing. Um, what I do want to say is echoing what uh, Representative Edmonds said about the budget. Um, you know, our team worked very hard in conjunction with Sarah Clark and the financial team at AHS um, put in front of uh, the, the governor um, a budget that we, we know we can live with for the remainder of fiscal year 21. Um, these are challenging times. Um, the COVID uh, mitigation work that is ongoing um, is very challenging for us. And so we believe that uh, what Matt's going to present for numbers right now are um, are healthy for us for, for this fiscal year. And I'll certainly entertain any questions after Matt um, goes through the spreadsheet of the ups and downs here. So I'm going to let Matt take it, Representative, and uh, we'll get moving and then come back to uh, answering questions. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, Matt Agostino, Financial Director for Corrections. Uh, there are three appropriations that the restated budget has changes in. So if you want to uh, move quickly through them, I can see on the first page that, that's on the screen toward the bottom of it, we have a base reduction in the parole board related to travel expenses. Um, so about a $22,000 reduction 
there has been over the past two fiscal years, a significant reduction in just travel costs uh, related to the parole board with the pandemic. Um, that's that's increased that even more so. Uh, we're, we're confident that this reduction in the budget will, will get their operating expenses for the parole board to where they should be. So there's, there's, not, a, there's not a significant challenge here in, in this particular line item, reducing this. Muted. I don't see any questions, so we can move beyond this one reduction to the parole board travel expenses. Sure. So there's nothing, there's no changes um, in the restated budget to correctional education either. The next changes will be, I believe, on the next page to correctional services. So at the top of the page, we have a technical adjustment. This is related to the, um, it's, an, it's a net neutral general fund. Um, technical adjustment here. It's related to the addition of the 30 new correctional officer positions that were in the FY20 budget. Um, prior to the original FY21 governor's recommend, the position numbers weren't created, so we didn't have the ability to include those positions. What this technical adjustment's doing is adding the cost of those salaries and benefits for the 30 positions and reducing by the same for the, um, this, was a, this was a net neutral addition anyway, but this is this is just making the technical adjustment to add the positions, but also back out the savings to vacancy over time and uh, uh, temporary staff costs that would balance these positions and, and make them be able to be done within the existing appropriation. Let's stop with those positions because we, we've, we've had a lot of conversation about the positions uh, of correctional officers. Um, I see one question from Representative Lanfer and then we'll see other people that have questions on that line item. Thank you. I just, I want to go back the net, the previous slide on the correctional education piece. Just, it's on 27 of 30 of those. So we're going to see here this, that there's no change here, which is, you know, probably comforting just to us. But when I'm looking at your presentation from February 5th, in those worksheets, this is the section that has the big change of moving the community high school of Vermont funding from the general fund to the education fund. So I just wanted to, to highlight that that was a that was a an um, an unresolved decision that was made that was not made yet before we we ended up leaving in March. So but for people that's where you would find or go back to to find it from January or February when he was here. Thank you. Thank you Diane. And so it's not reflected ups and down sheet because this is just the change over the governors in January. So we would see that education in education fund increase on the January and the down um, in the January GF. Is that correct, Commissioner or Matt? Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay. This is where it becomes confusing and we need to have the, the 2020 of uh, the January uh, side by side. Um, other than that, I don't believe there were any other uh, 20 January initiatives that would have reflected on this sheet. Matt, is that correct? The only other one would have been the annualization of salaries and benefits for the staff in corrections education. If it's helpful for the committee, I could talk through the what the, the logic of the change in the original recommended budget, governor's recommend was, or if not, we can move to Correctional services. Um, you mean as as far as moving the educational services to the edu uh, the, the the services to the education fund? Yes, I, I think that that was a, a fully discussed topic that I think that we all remember very clearly, and we have heard from Ways and Means, and we'll hear from House Education. So I don't think we need to do that at this point. Let's just continue with these changes. But Diane, thank you for highlighting that. That's where we would have seen it. So the next item, if there's no more questions on the technical adjustment, well, um, uh, the next. I'm, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Mary, did you have a question? Yes, um, and, and maybe this is something that corrections and institutions can take up with DOC when they go into this more deeply. I'm just curious of notwithstanding which fund pays for correctional education, have you seen a change in the charges to that fund, given that I'm assuming you've had restrictions on people coming in and out to provide education, et cetera. 
so I, I would have assumed you'd see some change to the costs there that we're not seeing reflected. And that may be too much detail for now, but we ought to kind of go into it a wee bit deeper. deeper. Sure, I, I, I can answer. Uh, so okay. uh, there, haven't, there haven't been any specific savings or changes that we've seen to date. Uh, and then the large reason for that is that the overwhelming majority of the correctional education's budget is for salary for the, the correctional educators and the, and the, the uh, staff. Um, there's their operating costs within that nearly three and a half million dollars are about 200,000 or less per year. So in terms of their, their, I can't say for sure whether there's been specific savings in the last several months um, related to operating, but most of those are fixed costs, like cost of internet and other, other things. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and supplies. So there has been likely some because people are not actually working in facilities or in the same way that they were seven, eight months ago. Uh, but the majority of the cost is, is to salaries. So there haven't been changes mm -hmm. there specifically. And they have not been tasked to other duties and have their those expenses charged to those other duties. That's what I'm after. And the answer is no. I see the commissioner no, shake. No, the, the answer the answer is no, Representative. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I do want to go back to the positions and and wanting to know that when you've been in for, you have talked about the difficulty of find, finding individuals to hire. Is is that still a challenge, or are you finding um, that you have? A, a large enough pool to choose from and that you don't have vacancies in key positions that you really need to fill. And you're talking about corrections officers now, Representative. The corrections correct. officers, yes. I yeah. moved back to the next budget. I'm yeah. sorry. Make no, 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 that's fine. That's fine. Um, so, you know, as we sit here right now, we have 48 um, corrections officers vacancies. We have a class of 14 in. Uh, we have run two classes during the COVID crisis, um, small classes, hybrid classes, um, being respectful of all protocols on uh, social distancing and masking and cleansing and the stuff that we need to do to keep it safe. Um, so we have 14 in, 48 vacancies still. Uh, I just had a meeting just before I get on this meeting with staff around the state. We'll have another class in, in October. I, and, and this is just another, um, after eight months of being the commissioner and taking a look at processes. Um, we are in the process, um, and I, I talked about this before the legis legislature left the building um, and, and went virtual. Uh, we are in the process now of changing our hiring process. My observation is, is that the process is chaotic. Um, it's decentralized, it needs to be centralized. We need to be more focused on the type of candidate we're looking for. We find um, just this morning staff reported that there's plenty of candidates applying. The, the answer is, is it the right candidates applying? So what we're focused on right now is the, is the turnover, the attrition rate, and, and the piece about retention. Because after observing this since January, I think our big challenge is retaining people. Mm -hmm. Not finding people, but retaining them. And so we're taking a dive into that. And I expect before the class happens in October um, that we'll have a new hiring process in place. What this budget process forced us to do is take a look at where we're spending overtime. And I think in the long run, the hiring process is gonna help us retain folks that can cut into this um, overtime amount that we spend every year. So I know that's a long answer to your question but it's not not finding folks, it's retaining them and taking the chaos out of the hiring process. And, and as you <clears throat> develop uh, new hiring practices and reduce your overtime, you yes. should see employees staying in longer, not the turnover. Right. And, excellent, thank Correct. you. We'll, I'll, be, I'll be looking. Thank, thank you. So Matt, if you'd like to continue, I think we were in correctional, had we, we were in correctional services. Yes, I think we're on page 28 of 30 now. Oh, um, Diane, 
Yeah, Representative Lanfear. Thank you. Um, Matt, I see on here at the bottom where it says in the grants adjustment to the medic, medic, Medicaid earnings, that amount 524,561 is the exact amount that in earlier in January you had listed as a um, community rehabilitation care case management that you were moving from general fund to global commitment. So I hate to assume just because it's the same number that that is the same description that you needed to return it back to general fund. It, it is. Talking? It is. Unfortunately, this is something where um, in, in exploring this further, it's something that we're, we still are working on. We anticipate that sometime near the end of FY21 or potentially FY22 will be possible. But at the at the moment, it wasn't it, there's there's no way of um, Turn, making this program Medicaid eligible in, in the short period of time. So we, we didn't want to include that full general fund and, and Medicaid global commitment swap in, in the FY21 budget, knowing that we it's unlikely that it will be Im implemented completely if started at all before FY21 is, is through. So, so thank you. Would it also be assuming that the other, the other uh, changes in January then occurred? Or I'm not too sure how to given the time frame and where we are in August, there was the uh, transitional housing case management of 297,000 that was moving over to global commitment. So would I be accurate in assuming that that has now occurred or are you? Uh, unfortunately waiting? not occurring, but not occurred. Uh, the, the pandemic, not to blame the pandemic for, but it did get in, in the way of some of the progress we were making. So we are still continuing to work on those efforts. Okay, so then that would be still there. And then the final one was the $26,000 reduction to that, which, uh, which was a 100% reduction to the COSA in Chittenden County, that 26,000. That was, yes, I believe to the South Burlington Community Justice Center. Um, it was, they, they, they're no longer providing COSA services, I believe, and, and that, was, that reduction has happened, yes. Okay, all right, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, Diane and Rep Emmons, your hand is up. Yes, um, I'm on the <clears throat> same sheet and I'm looking at the savings from health services contract of 1.7 million. Uh, I just want some real clarification on this. So this is a decrease of 1.7 million based on the governor's <clears throat> proposed budget that was presented to us in January. That's correct. Uh, when the when the FY21 budget was built um, prior to January, the governor's recommended budget, uh, we did not have the information uh, related to this fiscal year's health services contract. Uh, there has been from the prior contract that ended June 30th to the the one that Vital Core has now taken over effective July 1st. There was a significant decrease in the P, in the per inmate per month cost, um, and we're able to reduce the total allocation to health services by the 1.75 million related to that, as well as there's an electronic health record system that's being updated, but we're delaying the implementation only slightly to spread those costs over two fiscal years um, so that this, this doesn't have an impact to, uh, to the overall budget and our ability to still implement the EHR as well as deliver the healthcare services. So this 1.75 is reflective <clears throat> of our new contract with Vital Core. That's correct. Okay. So this is a little different than what was presented to us back in January. The government. That, that's, that's correct. And at that point, we we didn't we just didn't have the information related to the finance the financials of what you, what the year one of the contract would look like. Okay. Great. I just wanted that clarification. Thank you. So before we move to other items on this list, I don't see any um, hands, but that's a significant change. And I'm just want to pause and see if any other folks, you may go into it more in your committee, uh, uh, Rep Emmons, when you have a chance. Um, I, I do have a question. I hadn't realized that you were implementing a, an electronic health record system, a new one, um, Matt, are, has there been a 
conversation about kind of interoperability between what you're doing and systems out in the rest of the world for the EHR? I, I do know, and I don't want to. I don't want to jump over uh, Commissioner Baker if, if he has more oh, knowledge. Sorry. I do know that there's been previous conversations about systems that would work, that would be interoperable with with outside systems. I, I don't know the status. I, I don't believe there's been, but I, I may be incorrect in that statement. There, there, there really hasn't been pro uh, deep conversations about it, Representative. Part of um, the process of being able to spread it over two years is, is that um, we're not ready to move on the new record system. Um, and it comes with vital core. So the prior system oh. was Centurion system and we have access to it, but um, I don't think we've had a, a great deal of conversations about how this system will speak to other systems. I think that's what you're, you're asking. Yeah. I, I hadn't realized it was particular to uh, the healthcare vendor. Okay, I'll, I'll take that offline. Um, are there any other questions about the healthcare contract? Not seeing any. Um, and then in this area under correctional services, it, other than travel reductions, Matt, it looks like it's, I see you, Diane, it looks like the rest are kind of the standard 5% reductions in fee for space and so forth. That's right, all the internal yeah. service reductions, correct. Okay, uh, Rep Lanthier. Thank you, thank you for in indulging me a second time. So uh, just, just so I can mark it off on here, I see that there was a $281,000 reduction for mothballing Windsor. I should know, did that occur? That was in the... So that, that has occurred. Um, uh, Department of Corrections is no longer paying the, the costs uh, related to the Windsor facility. Okay, pardon, sorry my ignorance. I just wanna make sure I check it off is not something that it's done, so just I'll just check it off. Okay. I love I love that you get it, Diane. Thank you very much for tracking, Alice. Uh, Rep. Emmons. Yes, I just want to clarify. <clears throat> we have not. I know in DOC's world, they're no longer paying the fee for service for Windsor, but we have not mothballed Windsor. Based on our capital budget that we have already put in place and passed for FY twenty one that there's activities that's going to happen at the Windsor facility with Department of Forests and Parks and Department of Fish and Wildlife being relocated there from the state office building down in Springfield. So, so I don't want people to think that that, that building and that facility is being mothballed to totally. DOC has handed responsibility for Windsor over to BGS, who is working with those other departments to utilize that space. So it's just not on DOC's budget now. Correct. I just want to make that clarification. Yeah. Thank you. It's important. Um, Di, your hand is still up. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Um, is there anything else you'd like to tell us about under correctional services, DOC folks. No, unless anyone has any other questions about the adjustment for the Medicaid earnings, I think that's that's it on correctional services. Yeah, I have a hand from Rep. Coffey. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, commission. Good morning, Commissioner and, and Matt. Um, I had a question about. Um, with this, uh, the health services contract, I know that I've heard that you're pretty excited about this new partnership. Um, what kind of, are they still hiring the same staff on the ground, the folks who are working in the me medical staff in our facilities? And so is there a significant change there or how, I, how, I, they, how do they get those savings is, what I'm, is, is, is part of what I'm getting at. So the savings, the savings that we're talking about has nothing to do with hiring staff. In fact, um, uh, the, the CEO of VitalCore has changed a lot of the senior leadership on the ground here in Vermont and has paid significant salaries to new leadership coming in. 
So that budget reduction isn't tied to staffing, if that's part of your question. That is part of my question. Okay. And so the answer to the second part of your question is that um, um, I, I, I talked to the CEO, Viola uh, Riggins, down the matter of fact, I, I had a scheduled call with her this morning to go over some things that were discovered <clears throat> as they made the transition over that she wanted me to be aware of. Um, and, and so many of the staff that was in place on July 1st, she picked up. But in the meantime, she's actually brought in, had brought in um, the former assistant surgeon general of the United States to do clinical assessments of staff um, to assess their clinical skills. Um, you know, I, I support her 100% and you can't come in and just um, dismiss, um, you know, almost 150 staff members and try to find. And again, these, these are Vermonters that work in these positions. They live in Vermont, they're Vermonters, they're employed by, in this case now, Biocorp. Um, 118 of the staff members were brought over for, from Centurion. Centurion. Um, originally 11 were not brought over. Um, it, since they were brought over July 4th, um, 14 were terminated within the first week. Um, five have been terminated since July 10th. Um, there's still vacancies open um, that they continue to fill. So this is just some high level data that I get from, from them to understand the transition they're making from the former contractor to, to her oversight of the medical provider. Thank you, Commissioner. I feel like you, um, you, you knew exactly the question that I was asking, so thank you. Well, because um, <laughs> as you know, Representative, and I've actually exchanged an email with you about a constituent's concern about, about their, their loved one and the medical care. And uh, I, am, I am fully dialed in on the medical care piece um, as a result of the turn, turnover of the new contractor. Uh, if, if I can uh, follow up on this a little bit, just to let folks know, uh, our committee, Corrections and Institutions, is going to be looking in depth in terms of the healthcare contract with Commissioner Baker, as well as uh, talking with the CEO, Viola Riggins. The commissioner and I discussed having, um, trying to get her to testify before us. We're hoping sometime next week, possibly on Thursday is what we're looking at, but we haven't confirmed that. So our committee will be going into depth on this. So I just wanna give folks the heads up that we're trying to put it in place. Thank you. I think we're ready to move to um, the out of state bed contract. I, I did notice. I did notice. I apologize before we move because it's a fairly big one. I was so focused on general fund, I forgot to look a few columns over to the right. But we have the the COVID nineteen uh, the CRF request as well for uh, nearly five million dollars, the four million nine hundred fifty thousand. Um, DOC has had staff substantially dedicated to mitigation and and response efforts to COVID nineteen. We've also had significant PPE costs and other operating expenses related to COVID. So these these funds are requested as as part of that. Um, Matt, so, I have a question. Oops, sorry, Mary, may I jump in? Yes, please, it's all yours. No, I don't need that, but Matt, I had a question. Is the, is the request from this um, coming uh, out of the remainder of the dollars of the CRF, or is this a request that's going to go before the Joint Fiscal Committee? This is out of the remainder of those funds. I believe this hasn't gone in front of the Joint Fiscal Committee. Okay, and at this point, um, the, the, just so that both committees know that the administration has put their request in and the budget in as one bill, and, and it's up in the air right now um, whether we'll move a separate CRF bill, we'll, or whether we'll do some CRF spending like we did before in July and August, in um, not July and August, in June, um, within the, the quarter year budget, whether we'll do it within the budget. So those are numbers if you have these appropriations that we need to be paying attention to, um, to, to determine uh, where they're going to travel and if, and if and where they're going to travel, I should say. Thank you, Matt. So, Kitty, I can't raise my hand, but yes, on this topic, I'm now confused. Are, is the, 4.95 reflected in this budget 
funds that have already been allocated to DOC through this process, or is this a new request? New. Whoops, I shouldn't answer. Matt, you answer. That was the, yes, it's, it's a new request. Okay, and you are not showing the funds that you have already received for in CRF money anywhere here. Correct. Those 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 funds previously received are not shown here. That's right. Could and you've gotten a fairly significant amount already. Correct. That's 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 correct. Yes. Um, somehow, I would like to understand all that you've received and what what you have received is displacing and where that money went. Did you follow what I meant? I, I believe so. Um, okay. So for, you're asking, so that what, what, what general, effectively what general funds that the CRF displaced and where are those funds? So um, I can answer that for FY20 because um, we, we have not spent to, to date while there's been, um, so far in FY21, we, we don't have the full spending authority for the funds. Uh, but for the previous year, previous uh, general fund that was, I guess you could say, saved as a result of using the, the uh, CARES Act funding, um, was um, it wasn't money that was carried forward by DOC. It was money that that um, that was. Uh, I'm, I'm, tr I'm struggling for the right word here. Um, so it was swept or went to the bottom line and the bigger swept, budget. Swept was what I was going to say. It's not, not really the, but, but yes, effectively yeah. swept is the word. Yeah. And how much was that? Um, it was a substantial amount. It was, it was in the, the $5 million range. Okay. So about 5 million from FY20 of general fund dollars <laughs> that were enabled to go into the big pot. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary. Uh, Representative Taylor, I'm sorry I missed your hand from before. Oh, that's no problem. Uh, and let me, if this is uh, something that we should cover when our committee meets with uh, the Department of Corrections uh, next week, then we can pass over it. But there's two things that have happened since January. And one is the passage and signing of S338, the Justice Reinvestment. And the other, the pilot project that's being done in uh, Rutland. And I'm wondering if the financing for those is progressing as um, proposed. Let me take the pilot project representative you're talking about is what I briefed the committee on is the work with John Jay College on focus deterrence. Um, is that correct? Correct, yes. Yeah, so um, we, we have identified funds to support that. The process has, has been a little slow in coming to an arrangement with John Jay. Um, we just got a proposal, I think, Matt, at the beginning of the week. You and, and I just haven't that. been able. To, you and I just haven't been able to catch up on it. So that's moving forward, um, and it's really identified in three sites. So for the rest of the committee that may not be familiar with what we're talking about, uh, we're looking at um, engaging uh, the national uh, safe community operation out of John Jay College to focus on high risk domestic violence um, violators who are supervised by us in the community to try to cut down on, on the reoccurrence of violence, but also uh, wrapping services around them that um, cuts down on our reentry back into the jail system. So we have identified funds um, that were part of some of the COVID funds that can help us with that. As far as, um, the other piece on 338, it was part of the conversation in Senate appropriations yesterday. And I think we've got to go back and sort out. Um, we were kind of caught off guard, um, not understanding where that original 2 million that was in there. Um, we, we kind of lost track of that conversation. And Matt and I need to go back and figure that out. And I know Senator Sears is interested in us getting back to them on this conversation about particularly a $400,000 um, promise that was made to the statewide network for domestic violence battery intervention programming. So Matt, anything to add to that? No, I think you've covered it. Uh, 
Uh, Representative you. Taylor, thank you for that question. Do you have a follow up? No, no. And, and so as you get back to uh, Senate appropriations and Senator Sears with those questions, will you please share, will you share that with our committee yeah. as well? Absolutely, Representative. Well, our committee and, um, and obviously the Corrections Committee as Correct. well. Thank Correct, you. we will. Okay, if I don't see any other uh, questions, I think uh, Matt, let's move to the next section. Certainly. So for the out-of-state appropriation, uh, this, this one actually does tie in both the, the governor's recommend, the original recommend from January, as well as the restated budget. So the, the first five items you'll see under out-of-state, you'll see reversal of the FY21 proposal. So um, these, these net out to approximately $220,000 of, um, of an increase. So we, there are several initiatives that that back when the January budget was presented, uh, were unable to do at this time. Um, the the increase to the marshals, but the U.S. marshals beds, as well as the increase to the per diem, are, are not things that that at least during the pandemic can be looked at. Um, as as the, in FY twenty one, it's it's unlikely that these would come to fruition. Uh, we also had a proposal to fill the Caledonia work camp by the fifty beds. So we had we had coming into FY21 a base appropriation of 225 beds. Effectively, what these all of these line items do is it reduces that appropriation from a caseload of 225 to 206. Um, right now, we're at 219 beds out of state. So this is an, an additional uh, 13 beds below what what we currently are at. Okay, are there questions on the out-of-state beds and um, the reversal of the proposal that was uh, brought to us in January? I am not seeing any questions on that. Well, I well, have. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand, Alice. No, no I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Yeah, I am um, thinking too. <laughs> uh, I, I have a feeling these are gonna be moving dollars because uh, due to COVID, we've had movement of folks up at the St. Johnsbury Regional Correctional Facility as well as that has an impact on the work camp beds. And I just don't know how that would play in. And also on the out-of-state beds, because we've had some real conversations with Core Civic about COVID testing and really beefing up their operation there for isolation uh, when someone is positive, how that all impacts those dollars, if any. That's what's rattling through my brain. Yeah, Representative, I, I think I'll, I'll take this uh, because uh, it's, it's more about operational than it is about the financial piece that Matt would speak to. Um, you know, we're at 219 right now. I mean, I'll be more than happy to get into for the committee um, the COVID piece in Mississippi um, that we've been dealing with for the last three weeks. Um, but we, we, did, we did return St. Johnsbury from that surge unit, as you know, is no longer there in St. Johnsbury because we worked out a different process internally amongst the system to quarantine and medically isolate if we had positives. So we are in the process now of taking a serious look at um, readjustment of beds around the state to include in that conversation the work camp at St. Johnsbury, um, how we could balance out the system better to get more folks back from Mississippi. You know, I'm not there yet. Staff is not there yet, but that conversation is going on now, and it's a matter of balancing those beds out. But as you know, Representative, our challenge is, um, you know, our population today is 410. Um, we have 324 detained um, individuals in the system. That includes the marshal beds that I think are around 45 or 50. So the system itself, the justice system hasn't really opened up yet. So we're really, we can't predict the future on the justice system opening up what that means to our population, um, what the impacts of, how soon can we see impacts from 338? Uh, much of that doesn't go into effect until the fall and January into the summer. So how we do that, um, it's all kind of a, 
you know, it's 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 a little bit of uh, hope, um, but we are trying to figure out a way to get that number down as soon as we can in Mississippi by moving beds around, but not compromising our quarantine system that we have in place that has kept our facilities clean. You know, and again, the situation in Rutland speaks to that. You know, six inmates come back, and um, the quarantining system we had in place saved that facility from going out. Alice, do you have a follow-up? No, this is helpful. Thank you. And I, I'm sure that my committee will be looking into this more in depth. But I want to just put this out on the table for the members of Appropriations Committee, that these dollars will really change is my hunch. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Um, uh, Representative Hooper. Thank you. Um, in your calculation of bed needs, have you considered uh, the anticipated reopening of the courts and the pressure that that might create on the system? Yeah, yes, I mean, that's what I was just, I mean, I was referring okay, to that the system, the system hasn't opened up, right? Yeah. Um, the system itself hasn't opened up and what that impact may be on us. Um, it's been kind of interesting um, looking historically because one of the things I look at daily is the detained population, not the sentence population. And that, that number is really, um, you know, when you look at history here over the last year and a half, two years, we're, we're averaging about 100 below what we normally would have in a detained population on a daily basis, 80 to 100. Um, so now is that because the system isn't opened up? Um, there are arrests still occurring as a result of serious crime where people get lodged. Um, so um, it's hard to predict right now. And I think that's our challenge to identify balancing out beds, but keeping in mind two things, when the court system opens up and not compromising our ability in the long run to manage the COVID crisis, because I just don't see this going away for a while. So we've got to have those quarantine beds to be able to keep our facilities clean. Mary, do you have a Mary, did we lose you? No, I had already muted myself. I was trying to say I'm good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, just so that I'm, I'm clear with the ups and downs, the decrease, even though you're increasing the numbers, it's against, you know, it's not the policy that we want. We want to bring the inmates back to Vermont and house them in, our, in here in our own facilities. It's a decrease because of the costs of out-of-state versus in-state. Is that correct? The, the, the decrease that shows up here, you mean? Or in general? Yeah, it's about reducing the beds. And I think part of the reason why we've been, when I came in January, we were up around 255 in Mississippi. So, you know, we've demonstrated we can reduce these numbers um, slowly, but yeah, you got to figure in the wrong. other factors. Right. I was reading it wrong. I apologize. No, I, I see. I, I finally figured five, it out. <laughs> thank yes, you. Five, five, right. 586. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, any other questions on um, correctional services out of state uh, placement? Um, if not, let's go to the next budget. Or did you have anything else you wanted to? I think that was all the pieces in that one, okay? That's everything for out of state, correct? And that's, that's actually for the, the restated budget. That's, that's all of the changes that we have for DOC. Thank you. Um, so uh, from the January um, initiatives that were that were put forth when the budget was brought to us, uh, can you think of any um, any any large initiatives that that you would like to remind us of? I know Mary will be on top of it, and the uh, committee of jurisdiction will will as well. The one initiative that that was there was the movement of the Community High School of Vermont for the payment to come out of the education fund. So we're aware of that one. Are there any other ones that you would like to remind us of? 
or does this reflect most of the changes from, from January and August? I, I think representative, it, it, it represents when it tied to finances, um, it represents the big operational pieces as it's tied to finances. Okay. There's a lot of other work going on that's not, um, not related to cost or budget items, but um, I, I don't want to take the committee's time up on that. Okay, and policy, <laughs> language policy that was in place in January, we'll hear about on Monday. And, um, and any other policy changes? Alice, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, not at this point. Um, not at this point. Okay. No, I don't. I don't know if other committee members do or not, but I, I voiced what I was concerned about previously. Thank you. I have a question from Representative Jessup. Yeah, um, th thank you. This may be a, a question that uh, Chair Emmons's committee has covered more, but when, Commissioner, would we start to see costs associated with the overhaul of the women's facility start to show up on our spreadsheets. I think I'm, I think there's been some planning costs, but I don't know what else has been involved. And again, apologies if this has been covered elsewhere. So uh, you're talking about um, the potential for a new facility, correct? The planning process? That's right. Yeah. So I'm not completely up to speed to, 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 to today, but um, there was money that was allocated and a selection of a of a contractor has been made to start the planning process, you know, which is going to be fairly comprehensive because it isn't just about what's the building going to look like. It's really about programming and, you know, senses in the future and really looking at um, having the space to do quality programming um, for the type of um, um, offender that's in in the uh, women's population so I'm not current up to speed and representative Evans may even know more than I do right now but it's been it's been awarded there's a committee between us and BGS that are working on it <clears throat> and we're moving forward on that planning process as part of that money um, that was allocated for the planning so if I can yeah. weigh in because we've been looking at this and I know that representative Taylor has been uh, following this issue. It was a contract that went out uh, through BGS to really look at a cohesive plan in either re in replacing the women's correctional facility, but also within the context of the whole correctional system. And there was 200,000 that was put in in the FY20 capital budget for this particular um, contract. So that's where the money is. And um, Representative Taylor can weigh in a little bit more because he's looked into this a little bit more in depth. But the hope is that we will have uh, the information from this contract that, as Commissioner Baker mentioned, we're, they're working it through right now. And we should have the information by the time we reconvene in January um, in terms of how we go forward with, uh, we hope, a new correctional facility for the women, but it will also be a discussion on how we also move forward with all of our correctional facilities in a cohesive manner, because that's what really needs to happen. So if you do one, you've got to look at the whole system. Great, thank you. And, and just because we're here today, one quick question. Have we had any COVID uh, concerns at the women's facility to date? Um, we've had concerns at all the facilities. Um, I, don't, I, I don't believe, and I'd have to double check this representative, I do not believe that we've had any female inmates positive. I'd have to double check that. Um, um, but we, we've had folks present with symptoms and we've had to test them and so on. But remember, we test, we're testing every facility on, uh, uh, on a cycle. And we will continue to do that from the guidance from the governor on um, test to suppress. And I think um, we've demonstrated that this testing to suppress 
has controlled the virus in our facilities. So I don't think we've had any women positive, but I will double check that and make sure we get back to you, okay? Thank you. I just got a text from my principal assistant, which this is why commissioners have principal assistants because they make commissioners look very, very good, okay? We had one entry into the system of a female who came into the system, went into quarantine and we caught her positive on the way into the system. She wasn't in the system as a result of being positive. So does that help representative? Yes, thank you very much. Thank that you. was quick, thank you. Oh, that's, that's, uh, that's why you have a principal assistant to make you look good representative. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? Uh, representative Hooper. DOC has been fabulous, like star of the country in terms of COVID suppression. And we really need to appreciate how hard that is. My question is something that's hidden or not hidden deeply in the budget. Back in January, we heard from the Department of Public Safety that they had an agreement with DOC to get a little bit of money to provide for a mental health specialist slash technician. We asked the Department of Public Safety, which is doing a great job of trying to expand the mental health clinicians and the barracks notion or that service out in the community. They are still counting on that money from you. And way back when that was news to you and Matt. And I am curious if that budget, if that is now reflected in your budget because they're counting on it. Um, the last conversation that I had with Commissioner Sherling was that um, we would be committed to that uh, once we saw um, what we ended up with the remainder of the fiscal year 21 budget. So it isn't, it, it, as I understand the conversation prior to me getting here, it wasn't meant to be a line item that showed up. It was meant to be for us to find those funds in an existing budget. So that is the way I left it with Commissioner Sherling. And I, I, a month ago, month and a half ago, shortly after the skinny budget went into place, I asked them just to hold off on the conversation until I had a chance to see where our budget ended up for the rest of the year. So are you con continuing to plan to try to provide those that service to? We're continuing to have the conversation, hopeful that we can find the money to support that once we know what our final budget is. Oh, so it depends on us, huh? I'm, I, I'm not saying that, Representative. I'm, sim I'm sim simply saying, um, you know, checking, like, like all state agencies, we're all pressured, right, in this environment, so. Um, I can't, for example, I can't shortchange security in a jail um, to yep. support that. But if we can support it, we're going to support it because it's a commit, commitment that Commissioner Touche had made. And I yep. want to honor that. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, Representative Townsend. Uh, yes, and thank you. And to continue on that topic, um, do you have the, the approximation of what that amount was, was it $65,000, $75,000, something in that range? I don't remember off the top of my head. I do not remember that number. Um, I, I okay. can get, we can get back to you with that representative. I don't remember it off the top of my head. The clinicians I, I, that DPS is budgeting for, they're saying they're 75,000 all in per person. Just FYI. And the only reason that I had mentioned 65,000 was that that was the amount in their budget for one mental clinician in the original 21 budget. Right. It's gone up to 75,000 now. Right. Or we'll sort that out to see which number is, yeah. which yeah. is the accurate number. And my understanding of the agreement is, is that we're not providing all the funding for the positions. It's a shared funding arrangement between us and other folks to support public safety's um, plan to put those crisis workers out in the field at the barracks. 
you and other folks. Okay. Correct. That's that was my and again, I will go yeah. back and uh, verify that and I, I will get the information to the committee. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative welcome. Taylor. Uh, yes, just a, a quick clarification. When you're referring to the group which is looking into the women's facility and the uh, construction or possible construction of a new one, is that the same as the corrections feasibility study? Or is this a separate one? No, it's 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 that group that BGS is running as a result of, I, I, I don't know if that's the title of a representative or not, but it's the okay. group that's working on the allocation that was given for the feasibility of the of the facility. Okay, but this is that that uh, that's actually for the whole of the correction system, not just for the women's facility specifically. Correct. Uh, well, I think it, going back to Representative Evans' point, as I understand it, before my time, the money was allocated for the purposes of the female facility, but as part of that conversation. Um, you can't have a conversation about the female facility without taking in the rest of the system to understand the impact on the rest of the system. That's okay. my understanding. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, we are closing in on the 11 o'clock uh, hour. And so, Mary, as there are additional questions from our committee, we will go through you and Alice. Um, I'm hoping that um, if you have um, any more, if you have additional testimony that um, that our member, Mary, could join your committee uh, to hear that testimony uh, so that we're just all staying together to move to expedite this budget as quickly as possible. Uh, the large issue I see here from January is the fund issue and a decision was made uh, back in January um, or February. We heard from the two committees of jurisdiction um, on, on the funding issue, which would be the Education Committee and Ways and Means, and, and neither of those committees supported that move. Um, we did see some additional reductions um, with the parole board uh, with travel expenses and uh, the net neutral movement between the 30 correctional uh, uh, officer positions. And um, I think all questions have been answered there. There's additional information that will come back regarding the passage of 338 S338, the justice reinvestment that, that you will provide, uh, Commissioner, thank you. And uh, then we'll continue seeing the rollout, um, the updates as you roll out the pilot program in the three communities uh, regarding um, offenders, um, serious offenders and, um, and reducing recidivism and providing services to, to see how those pilot projects move. Um, the, um, Mary is going to work on the balancing pieces uh, where the, the numbers are with Matt to understand the CRF and how GF money was uh, replaced where appropriate and where those dollars fell. Um, as far as the 40, uh, the 4.9 million, uh, that's a CRF issue. So our committee will handle that outside our, our regular uh, budget discussions. That will be within the remainder of the CRF uh, budgeting. And other than that, um, and we'll look forward to um, the, the piece with the mental health clinician that was being paid for out of DOC for DPS. So we'll, we'll see where that lands as well. But I think those are the highlights. Um, from uh, Alice, you're shaking your head. Yes. Did, did, did I miss anything? I know you have a piece on the healthcare contract that you're going to take additional testimony on. Correct. As, but as far as the budget moving, um, the one piece that we would have to find when we solve the bigger budget is if um, the, the Ed Fund, um, if Community High School of Vermont returns to the general fund, picking up, I think it's almost $4 million. Um, is there anything else from anybody on either yeah. of the committees that I've missed? Mary? If they are not granted the use of the CR the of the additional CRF funds, that's a five million dollar problem. Right. So we have a total of an eight million dollar mm -hmm. problem. And if we don't grant that, there we have to find it in the budget. Oh, correct. Okay, and that 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 CRF um, uh, just because Steve joined uh, jumped on was not part of the 
fiscal committee, but out of the remainder um, of the the remainder was not spent of the 1.25 billion. I think there's about 130 million uh, there left to appropriate. Is that the correct number, Steve, that's left to appropriate? I just switched topics and we can catch up on that number later. Uh, actually, there's there's more than that. Um, it's, uh, the and I'm, we're just sort of trying to sort of summarize this in a sheet. The, the total amount left appropriate is about 198 million of unallocated money, of which the administration has put 133 million into economic development, uh, 100,000, you know, 100,000 of PSD, AOE, guide house kind of 500,000. And then there's the waterfall appropriations, which are actually in the money. Okay, it's 44 million of the Vermont State Colleges. So <clears throat> it's a funny type of waterfall concept. They were included in the um, the amount that in the total amount available. So that's the state colleges, ADS, SOS, and AOE, AOA. So I'm not quite sure why they call them waterfall. They're like tier two money. And the total amount after all the appropriation in the restatement requests is about $1.8 million left. So um, that's the piece we're just sort of discovering in the last 12 hours. Thank you, Steve, for that update. And and just so for our committees, uh, I really want to separate CRF funding from um, budget funding. But here, as Mary pointed out, uh, the CRF dollars, if we don't, if they're not made available, and I'm not suggesting they are or they are not, if they're not made available, then uh, we do have to pick up uh, that five million in the budget. So they're. Um, if, if, if I may, Representative Toll, I think it's a, it's a little more complex than that. And I think Matt and I can circle around with Representative Hooper about that. Okay. It, it, it's not GF, it's just not a swap of GF funding then. It's not the way it's presented here. And there's some reasons for that um, okay. that we can discuss. Okay, thank you. Uh, any final questions? So, Diane, is that a hand? Yeah, oh. sorry, yeah, it's a little hand. Um, so I'm trying to keep track of what's being asked for with the uh, Joint Fiscal Committee and and what's being asked in budget only. On the, I, I know that Steve will be, he's the one that's going to be on top of this. But I have in front of me here the JFC request of from, from Susan Young on August 19th has oh. $4 million. And I, was, I went back to that thinking maybe the corrections piece is a part of that, that 4.9. It is, it, it is not, and, but no. I'm sure, no. So I'm gonna hand write that on the side that I'm sure we'll get more on it, but there's 47 million that they're asking for in, in, uh, in that process. Yeah, and that 47 million, 20 of it is the uh, unemployment comp uh, money, 12 million is for childcare, and uh, I don't have the other elements in front of me, but I, uh, we can go through those. Our committee will have a CRF discussion. I don't want to hold DOC here for, a, for a, a, an overall of the CRF. But thank you, Diane, for the question. And, and, and we'll schedule Steve in on Monday, Steve, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. on the CRF when uh, Maria uh, comes in. But if not, uh, Commissioner, uh, um, <laughs> Thank you for your good work. I know it's a challenging time, and um, both you and me did a solid job. And the challenges will continue, but we have faith that you're getting them sorted out. Thank, thank you for your support and your time. We appreciate it. And I'd like to thank the Committee of Jurisdiction for supporting us. It's uh, for uh, not supporting us, for joining us in this meeting and supporting us with your information so that we can move this budget uh, quickly. So, Teresa, I, I, appre on. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I find sometimes it's harder to multitask at home than it is in the state house. <laughs> certainly is. Okay. Except I got more space here. Please.